I would like to ask my audience a question. Can anyone remember a time when Washington, D.C., and the leaders of our military felt it was necessary to bribe foreign militaries to not fight back? to offer monetary reward in exchange for desertion. The reason I've started with this picture is because the alleged Venezuelan defectors that drove these two National Guard vehicles into the barricades last weekend during Washington, D.C.'s field coup attempt were paid $20,000. Now, many people like go, oh my gosh, what horrible people, the $20,000. Well, Equivalent purchasing power in bolivars would be like something near two million dollars here. Twenty thousand U.S. dollars in Venezuela goes a very, very long way. You would be an incredibly wealthy individual, and I don't know that anyone is keeping an eye on these defectors. Are they able to send the money back to Venezuela? Are they? possibly going to return? And are they being held against their will to not do so? I would also like to ask my audience another question, and this might get me in some trouble, but I want honest answers. The vast majority of our military, E1, E2, E3, E4, are in the age range of 18 to 21. Do you think that if you went up to a random cross-section of young people that age and offered them the equivalent of two million U.S. dollars to take off their uniform, walk away, and go AWOL, how many of those young people do you think might make that poor decision? Quite a few, I think. And it's not about loyalty. It's about youth and their inability to look down the road to see long-term the um, ramifications of their actions. It would be a poor decision, but I bet a lot of 18 and 19-year-olds, especially if you caught them on the right day in the military, and those of you who have served know what I mean, and you walked up with a suitcase with $2 million in it and said, you can have this suitcase and you give me your uniform and... We're going to put you in a car and we're going to take you to this other place. There are some days, I guarantee, you would have quite a few folks in our military. And that doesn't mean our military is bad. That doesn't mean that our soldiers are just um, the worst. That just means that they're young. That just means, and that's the vast majority, Marco Rubio, a random guy named Juan, have floated out numbers like something like 600 have defected, and even if you would accept that number, that's still a microscopic amount. But they don't make any pretense about bribing these Venezuelan soldiers, and I'd like to show you something. Now, this is a story out of Venezuela, but it makes perfect sense when you read it. Mike Pence recriminates a random guy named Juan for his failure in Venezuela. The Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, reproached the self-proclaimed interim president of Venezuela for the failure that has represented the um, insertion of this supposed humanitarian aid. And for those of you who think that it was humanitarian aid, you're out of your mind. They searched the vehicle. It was full of nails and rocks and barbed wire and things that the opposition could use against the current government. It wasn't food. It wasn't solely food. Let me put it that way. The situation was created within the framework of the regional summit held in Bogota, where they all met. Now listen to this. Apparently, sources close to the meeting held in the Colombian capital asserted that there were recriminations for the uncommitted attitude of the Venezuelan millionaires living abroad who did not provide the expected funding for bribes and other payments in the middle of the coup. Now, does that make sense? For their plan last weekend to have worked, they would have needed massive help 
from inside Venezuela, and that did not come to fruition. And that is a great example of how disconnected Washington, D.C. is from the reality on the ground in Latin America. I also would like to show you something else, and I want you to think about this critically. There is a proposition out there now to allow anybody who comes here from Venezuela to remain in the United States, even if they come here illegally. Now, think about the logic that says, if you flee Honduras or uh, anywhere in Central America, and you're fleeing because of drug gangs or because of financial problems, that we're going to meet you at our border with our military, and we're going to send you back. But if you are fleeing evil, terrible, horrible socialism in Venezuela, oh, come on in, everything's fine, oh, you poor guys, how did you make it so, so long, man? You guys are heroes. Here's $5,000. Think of the logic that allows that. And once again, the guy on the screen, we find right at the middle of this, don't we? Many have also asked why I haven't talked about the real problem. Well, Venezuela is the front line of this fight. They are... If they go down, they're going to be the last major country in the world that has been able to throw off these chains. The Rothschild banking cartel that took over this country a little over 100 years ago did so in a way that would require the vast majority of Americans to be educated a lot more than what they are, to understand what they did and how they did it. But the world is moving away from dollarization. Washington, D.C., this country, we do not play on a level playing field in the world. I know many of you out there who disagree with me about my assertions regarding this entire thing believe that Gosh, if only Venezuela would just do things the way we do them here in the United States, they would be wealthy and happy and just like we are. You're out of your mind. You're out of your, absolutely out of your mind. They would have to, first of all, give up their sovereignty. They wouldn't be Venezuelans. They would have to become a vassal state of the United States using the dollar only. And mark my words, those days are coming to a close. Argentina has figured out very clearly how bad a decision it was financially to dollarize. Ecuador, another country down there, is trying to quit dollarization. And I'd like to read another segment here from, this was an article put out Wednesday, 14 May 2014, talking about Russia and how they were trying to create this, what they call multipolar world, where everything isn't just so dominated by the petrodollar. And I'll link all this, and you can read it for yourself, of course, if you can't see it. That Russia has been pushing for trade arrangements that minimize the participation and influence of the U.S. dollar ever since the onset of the Ukraine crisis is no secret. Until now, much of this was in the realm of hearsay and general wishful thinking. After all, surely it's ridiculous that a country can seriously contemplate to exist outside the ideological and religious confines of the petrodollar. Because if one can do it, all can do it. And next thing you know, the U.S. has hyperinflation, social collapse, civil war, and all those other features prominently featured in other quote-unquote socialist banana republics like Venezuela, which alas do not have a global reserve currency to kick around. That is an excellent paragraph, because what does it reveal? It reveals that the only reason we enjoy the standard of living that we do is because of the petrodollar. It's not because of capitalism. It's not because of free market principles or because we're just super, super great, excellent people and the rest of the world suck. Real quick, I can give you a Chevy or I can give you a BMW. Which one do you take? Right. Yeah, that's what I thought. We are good at some things and we're not so good at others. But one thing that we have strong-armed the world on 
is this issue with the U.S. dollar and what makes things worth what they are. I'll link this article, too, about how if you can just have good fiscal policy, dollarization isn't necessary, and when you stop equating massive amounts of physical wealth and being well-to-do with being successful, then you have a completely different attitude. This is real. It was in the realm of conspiracy theory for a long time. I will link an article that will explain this so that people can understand what's happened in this country for the last hundred years and why we have this disparity. Why the issues in Venezuela are so important. Because what is happening down there is not some teaching moment about uh, socialism versus capitalism. It's not. The collapse down there was engineered by the United States, created by the United States, for the specific purpose of overthrowing a government that did not subscribe to Washington, D.C.'s theory of how the world should be. We can't do it with China because they're too powerful and they would create as much pain in our hemisphere as we could create in theirs. This was on our leader's to-do list very high when he first took office in 2016. And there are articles out there talking about this all the way back as early as March of 2017, where he was asking, why can't we invade Venezuela? With the exchange rates down there being what they are, and the official exchange rate is 10 to 1, by the way, in case anybody just wants to know. It's the black market exchange rate that has totally caused the nightmare in Venezuela. What they call the black market dollar. We shouldn't have to bribe militaries to stand down. And for those of you who think it would just be this easy cakewalk where we could just bomb the daylights out of it and launch missiles and all this kind of stuff, why isn't Washington, D.C. just doing that? You think it's out of the kindness of their hearts? Why are they trying to bribe and convince a military that is standing against us to commit treason and desert? Why are they paying off people to come to the other side? Think about that in any other context than this, and outside of any other context than Fox News and CNN, and you will have a very nauseating conclusion that Washington, D.C. doesn't think it can win, because it knows that it won't be the U.S., pardon me, D.C. versus Venezuela. The first boot that hits the ground down there is going to be Washington, D.C. and our military versus the entirety of South America. There will be no safe haven for our soldier, sailors, airmen, marines, other than off, on ships offshore. And the vast majority of those Caribbean nations have said explicitly no U.S. warships will be allowed in our waters. This is the dirty secret that D.C. doesn't want you to know. They don't think they can win, not because they think that the Venezuelan army versus the U.S. army is not a winner. It's because they realize it'll be coming from all sides. Even the Colombians are having second thoughts. The Brazilians have already come out and said, nope, not from here. We don't win this militarily. But I don't think that's going to stop our leader because he's a nut job. But I'll leave that there. Like, share, subscribe.